What I do here at Waves is actually providing the, the link between the real world of studio work, production, and the kind of more geeky world of mathematics and uh, science. So it's, it's a really exciting journey and I'm excited every time again I've been involved with, I don't know, 50 or 60 products or more. I joined Waves uh, 20 years ago uh, when it was just starting up and um, a mayor uh, who is one of the founders uh, called me and asked me to join. He was a friend of mine and uh, a funny thing, I said, uh, I'm not available. I was busy doing uh, medical imaging uh, algorithms. A year later, after he called me, when I actually joined the company, um, I fell in love with audio. I have been a musician uh, for many years, and uh, this got attached right to my, to my heart. And finally, I was able to do the, to affect the way I feel and the way I uh, combine the art and the algorithms. It's a big gift for a person to be able to do that. Uh, I've been with Waves for 14 years now, and uh, I've known uh, one of the founders uh, since uh, 1982, uh, and he's, he's the, still the owner and the CEO of Waves. Waves is a company that's fairly flat in the way we work, although you know each department has its, its goals. We kind of share a, a mutual uh, understanding of where we're going. Uh, we meet in the hallway. Each one can walk into anyone's room. There's no structured uh, uh, meetings. It kind of works as a, as a team and uh, it works pretty well for us all. I've been with Waves for about 17 years and um, I was originally the f first kind of uh, product manager and um, now I've became uh, um, a whole division of product managers. We collect a bunch of, you know, ideas, things that we hear from here and there, uh, things that become available from the engineering point of view, the R&D people come with some kind of uh, an algorithm and say, hey, we've got this thing, it can do this and that. Do you think that's interesting? Do you want a demo? Sometimes the early formation of an algorithm is not a real-time one. It's one where um, the engineer renders stuff. The day of an R&D engineer is really crazy, actually. Uh, you come uh, in the morning starting the day you thinking you're going to do something and by noon, you understand that you're going to do something completely different. <laughs> and we have to think out of the box a lot to do it. In the beginning, uh, we were a very small team and we, we developed uh, new plugins and uh, we were actually um, coming up with ideas what we should do and just did them. So we, we came up with ideas to, for uh, basic processors like equalizers, limiters, uh, uh, stereo imaging, reverberation, and we, we just thought what would be the right controls and what would be the right algorithms, and we implemented them right away and shipped them. So we didn't have, in the very beginning, 20 years ago, we didn't have the methodology uh, that we have today. And during the years, this shifted up a lot to a, a very uh, product-oriented company, marketing-oriented and, and, uh, and uh, end-user-oriented where our uh, uh, customers define more and more uh, the tools. Originally, we defined the needs for the users. Today, we're trying to uh, ask the users for the needs. And so it's, it's a very different team today. But again, if you remember, Waves is, is kind of a flat company. And uh, suggestions come from various departments. Uh, we've got our front of house and live guys out there suggesting plugins. We've got a lot of our pro users and engineers suggesting plugins. Uh, we have uh, the R&D department, which come up with some amazing ideas. Then on the other hand, there's the marketing people. Um, and so a certain product can start uh, due to a certain marketing research effort that uh, brings back some input that, okay, uh, people in the post-production industry or in the uh, broadcast industry need very good um, loudness metering. There's new standards coming up and they're going to be regulated all over Europe or something. And uh, so that's an incentive 
to create a product or to start some initial research on what, what, what it's going to take. Start up a new project or a new product in Waves. When, for example, new hardware or a new plugin. It's usually something very new. It's something we, we have no idea how to start. And we have to study a lot. There's a lot of confusion in the beginning. Like you come in the morning and you look, okay, today I'm starting a new kind of equalizer that nobody did in the past. How on earth I'm going to do it? So basically we, we do some brainstorming and we, uh, we do it together with uh, the product uh, managers. We try to do it together with some of our uh, senior sound engineers. And we try to, to overview the methods that we know usually. Nothing that we know matches, you know, you, you need to start right from the start. We put a dedicated person on the tasks, that person is, is going to carry out the algorithm framework for that one, and they're going to uh, talk to experts in the field, talk to uh, uh, professors uh, in, the, uh, in the universities, and come up with a solution that is not only practical, but also state-of-the-art. And since that project is so long, sometimes a new project in some new domain takes several years, we have to catch up sometimes with the competition, catch up with new requirements in the market. This is so business. So sometimes people um, get crazy about one fashion and, and they turn uh, to, to another fashion a year later and they want something a little different. So we, we have to match up. It's a constant learning cycle. You know, every product we make teaches us all kinds of things. Obviously, the stuff we did with SSL was one of our first modeling projects. It was preceded by a long time of just uh, researching. And um, there were, you know, in our first attempts at modeling, we didn't really think it was good enough. So no product came out. It took a while until uh, we had that cooperation with SSL that we decided that, okay, the technology is good enough, and SSL are telling us that it's there. They're ready to put their brand name on uh, our um, uh, emulations, and that, that means that we have the stamp of approval, and that means that our technology has come of age. Ten years ago, uh, we had a moment where we were convinced that that's it. We did all the plugins we could ever do, and there could be no more algorithms, no more effects, and any studio can just have whatever the, what they wanted, and the Waves uh, line of products was full. And surprisingly, we, we found out that there's an enormous a mass of, of new ideas that came up. It came up with the new possibilities of, of processing, where there are, there are new processors that could do a lot more and new ideas in the, in the academic world that, that provided a whole new class of ideas. So today we can do a lot more. For example, physical modeling. Who would dream about that? Like 10, 10 years ago, we didn't even dream we could do it in real time. I've been working at Waves for 11 years now, and uh, I'm in charge of managing the plugin project of all the modeling series we've done and the artist signature. That's my main thing here. Usually when we join someone like Andrew Sheps or Jack Joseph Puig, we're going for uh, pieces of hardware that they've been practically sleeping with for a long time and they know exactly how they're supposed to sound. And for me, um, that's reassurance. So first of all, the most important for me uh, is the fact that they give me the assurance that this unit sounds good the progress uh, of my work is going into a good direction. They have a lot of feedback that sometimes I as a developer uh, don't pay attention to. They have the keen ears that point me to specific problems in the sound that uh, needs to be improved and fixed. So that's, that's their part, that's their job. The H-Comp, the hybrid compressor, that compressor that brings uh, the best of uh, both worlds, the analog world and the digital uh, plug-in world. The H-Comp is a great compressor and allows you to do parallel compression, mix knob where you can combine the original with a compressed uh, signal. It has one feature that many people miss. It has a punch knob. 
And that knob does something that is unique only to the hybrid compressor. It allows you to um, have a very quick attack time. Now, when you apply, normally when you apply a, a quick attack time for a compressor, it may um, kill some of the punch of, uh, for example, a drum hit, because very quickly it would introduce uh, gain attenuation. The punch knob is actually a little bit like a pre-delay kind of thing. So it would delay by just uh, so many samples as you set it, the attack of the compressor so you can have quick attack and let enough of the transient through to retain that punch. One most recent one that um, I really think that a lot of people are missing and not really understanding what it's capable of doing for them is in-phase. I really believe that in-phase can have a lot of impact on your sound if you know how to use it and if you understand phase relations. I'll give you a small example, uh, a theoretical example. Let's say you have a mix going on. Okay, and you really like it, but you want to have maybe your top end a little bit more present. Now, one thing would be, an immediate thing would be to go reach out an EQ and just raise a shelf or something like that, five, six, seven K, bring up some top end into your mix and done. But then usually it changes other things that you don't really want because EQ introduces phase shift obviously, and it increases energy. Another way to go around it is we, we all know that whatever is reaching first in time to the ear, the ear perceives it as louder, closer to us. So you can take in-phase, for example, and delay the low frequencies without changing the energy, just making sure the high frequencies will reach the ear before that'll be very similar as to add an EQ, but you don't add energy. You're just delaying the low frequencies in time. Theoretically, it works on pretty much anything. Try next time to open a mix of yours and try to do some, not everything, but some of the mastering in the frequency domain using in phases on different tracks. Like, for example, if you want the, the hi-hat to come out a little bit more, open an in-phase on the hi-hat track, try to uh, end an in-phase on, on the master track, delay the low frequencies, okay, by basically applying an all-pass, and see how suddenly the high frequencies will, you'll feel like they're coming closer to you, and maybe they're more energized right now, but they're not because you just changed the time of different frequencies reaching your ear. That's something that a lot of people are not, probably are not aware. A lot of people are coming to me and telling me, you know, um, what you guys need to do is uh, little labs. And I'm like, well, we've done it. It's called in phase, but uh, they're not quite, don't quite understand what is it that it's doing. But in phase is an amazing tool. It's still very, very exciting. There are a lot of challenges to overcome, a lot of new concepts, new ideas. And obviously, as technology progresses, there are even more possibilities and features and ideas that have to manifest into code and into a user experience and all that. So very exciting. It's great to get all that feedback, the, the Grammy, obviously, and all those uh, awards, and, uh, you know, the respect of, uh, of a lot of people in the industry. But um, I enjoy it from a different perspective as well, because I get to use it. So, in fact, I'm designing the products that myself and my peers will be using in two years' time. So as a producer and as an engineer, it keeps me on the cutting edge of the technology because I'm actually 
building, inventing, designing the products that everyone will be using in the future, sometimes near, sometimes not so near, because sometimes we get stuck with products because we want to make sure that everything is perfect. And sometimes it takes a lot of, you know, it always takes a lot of effort, but sometimes it takes longer than expected. I bring all my experience from, like I said, from the real world, from the studio work um, to designing the products that we make. So all my arguments have solid reasons, solid justifications, and it's all based on my experience and things that I would like to see in products, things that we are missing as, uh, you know, engineers, as producers, as beat makers. Um, so for me, it's all kind of interleaved, my work with Waves and my production and mixing work. Uh, it's kind of almost the same thing. I, in my studio work, I feel like I miss something. I have an idea. I would like to see something uh, within a processor, like a compressor or something, or uh, a, a new reverb or a new delay or a new processor. Then I go and I can make it. It's pretty exciting to be able to, to be in that position where I'm actually creating instruments that will basically influence the whole sound of the next like two, three years, you know. But above all, it's, it's the sound. Uh, and that's not something you can explain. You just hear it, you know. I think that, uh, and I'm not the only one, obviously, but... Our sound is unique, it just sounds good. One of the old ones, which is now pretty classic, is the super tap delay. I wanted to have a delay that will be easy to use for people who, who are familiar with, um, you know, moving regions on a grid. And that's how we designed the, the SuperTap delay. So it resembles moving um, MIDI regions or audio regions in a graphic way. And each one represents a voice and you have the time axis and you just move them and they snap to grid and all those things that we're very familiar with. Before we released the SuperTap delay, all multi-tap delays were like with numbers and they were really complicated to set up. I wanted it to be very graphic, very intuitive, very hands-on. And uh, I think we succeeded with that. When you develop a product, there are two uh, main things you want to pay attention to. First one is algorithms, the development stage, the sound. And then uh, the other part is the user experience how to present the plugin to the user, how to make it fun for him to work, what is he looking for? If we were uh, looking at Waves, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, the main time of developing a plugin was to develop the sound, the algorithm. As time went by, we realized that a lot of the time and effort in development is actually going in the user experience part how to design the GUI, how to get the control ranges right. So when we reached the artist signature, it was much, much more uh, emphasis on user experience. And to do it well, you need to do a lot of interactions between certain stages of development. There's always a fight between me as a developer that the main idea is to present a plugin with the minimum control possible to keep the user in focus in the specific sound area that the plugin is offering. And the artist on the other side, that obviously because he is a professional, because he's well-trained in using the tools, he wants more options. And it's always this constant fight between, do we really have to have that control? Can't we do without it? Because if we can, let's remove it. It'll make it easier for the user. But no, I really need the option to change the rate of the LFO or whatever it is. And eventually you reach a point where you get a good balance between ease of use and features in the plugin. But that takes a long process and a very hard process to achieve. So 
Although artist signature seems to be like a very simple thing to do, in the background there is a lot, a lot of thinking and a lot of effort was given to how to present it to the user. The idea of, of having a system that is able to guarantee real-time processing uh, is probably the fundamental idea behind approaching the live sound market. Uh, I'm referring to SoundGrid, which is uh, the technology we use in within the program, which we call multi-rack SoundGrid, within the servers and the plugins, which are now all called SoundGrid compatible. The SoundGrid technology really enables you to approach the live sound market with networking, reliability, real-time processing, and uh, full redundancy. Just the ability to provide those points to the live sound market sparked the idea that this is what we need to do, and that's how we went forward. Uh, we needed a partner to do that. The first partner that joined in was Yamaha, and we created a dedicated card for the Yamaha consoles, which uh, then sparked off the relationship with Digico, Allen & Heat, and now all live sound consoles, either through MADI, Optical, or BNC, using the DigiGrid MGB or MGO. Live sound has become a very big part of our company. Not only are we creating the platform for live sound engineers to work with, i.e. SoundGrid, we've also created a platform for them to use the plugins, which is Multirack, and then went on to create dedicated live sound plugins. It's all about timing and delivery. I think we have a great product, and I think the time was right, and we had some amazing partners, and we still have some amazing partners. Um, Waves alone hasn't changed the live sound market. It's a combination of talented engineers, high-end digital consoles coming to the live sound market, high-end loudspeaker configurations, better setup systems, and the ability to process with Waves plugins. 15 years ago, the basic structure of where an artist would gain profit has changed from album or CD sales to live performance. On the other hand, the expectation of any panther out there to go to a live gig and pay several hundred dollars has been, I want quality audio in a live performance as well. We, Waves, are part of that shift of creating the option for any engineer, an artist, to deliver the same quality sound he has in the studio in a live sound environment. As we do in the recording studio market or the, or the pro market, uh, we've got a very long list of front of house engineers, monitor engineers, system engineers who work with us to define what's required, what's needed, and how they see the market on a day-to-day -day basis. Because they're, they're really our face. They are out there day after day doing the job and we're supplying the tools. So we really listen to them. We, we have daily conferences with them. And uh, some of them are, are actually working with Waves on a daily basis to provide us with the knowledge required in order to move forward with new developments. Getting live sound engineers to adopt plugins um, is, is really starts from, again, from the technology, from SoundGrid. We went out there and started educating them about the technology behind the plugins or what makes the plugins run in a live sound situation that makes them feel comfortable. So there's all these building blocks from the I.O., from the server, which does the crunching numbers, from the uh, dedicated application, uh, redundancy. Because a lot of them have known the plugins or have heard of Waves, but that was kind of the studio world. Uh, when things go wrong in a studio, well, you've got a minute to think about it. When they go wrong in live sound, you're dead. So we really needed to convince, convince them that what we had was a full solution that makes it a great product for them to use on one hand and delivers super quality for any performance with the added advantage of full redundancy.
we're only, I think, at the at the high tip of where these engineers are, and, and the user base uh, is is huge, and we need to expand for years to come into live sound. Um, but the adoption is is massive. One of the most uh, strange projects that we handled uh, was the center plugin. It began uh, in a project that we did uh, internally uh, in the R&D. We were trying to do some kind of unmixing, pre-recorded stuff, so that we can do some uh, re-imaging uh, and uh, remixing uh, uh, to stereo recordings. We came up with an algorithm and uh, I was actually working personally on developing it and uh, I thought it was terrible. I listened to it and uh, actually I didn't think it was doing the job. So I put it aside and it was uh, lying on the side for about two years. Nobody was ever using it. But one of the founders, Gilad Karen, had a copy. And two years later he ran it uh, by chance and uh, listened to it and fell in love. He told me, this is doing something great. It's a miracle happening there. You're able to enhance the center sound separately than the sides. Uh, I've never heard something similar before. You have to make it into a product. So I had to uh, dig up the uh, old uh, implementation and to come up with a new implementation of that algorithm. And uh, there came out the center plugin which uh, eventually we are now doing uh, a lot of things with it. And this technology uh, started uh, uh, finding itself into many products, like into uh, Upmix plugin and some of the consumer uh, algorithms that we are doing. We are able to enhance dialogue, we are able to uh, re-image the, the stereo. Now today I, I believe, just like Gilad, that this is doing something miracle. That is our first um, synth, first uh, virtual synth. We worked hard on that. The graphic interface is very unique in the sense that it's all on one screen, even though it's very, very complicated and sophisticated that otherwise would have to have uh, many menus and drop-down menus and, and all that. But now you can actually see everything on one screen. And for a synthesizer with its uh, capabilities, that's, I think that it's quite cool because it's a semi-modular synthesizer and you can do a lot. You can generate loads of different weird noises as well as you know, very useful sounds for production, but all on one screen. I make the default presets. Like when we did the SSL channel, I almost did them you know, because I know the SSL so well, I've worked on it so, um, for thousands of, of hours. And when I came to do the, the, the menu presets, it was almost like I could do them blindfolded. You know, it was like... But for the element, it was a lot of fun creating those presets because, you know, it's a synth. So it's much more creative. You create something from nothing. The initial idea is... It's for beginners, people who are just entering the world of sound. They want to get fast results. Maybe we can call them musicians, ones who are recording a lot of their material today, but they don't want to sit down and figure out how to exactly tweak an EQ and a compressor and make it sound good. They just want to get like a quick sound going on so they can move on and get creative. That's the idea behind it. But we found that a lot of professionals are also using it because it's really easy to use. It's one knob, it does what it does, and whether you like it, you leave it on. If you don't, you remove it. But the beautiful thing about it is that you know if it's good for you or not suitable for you very quickly. As opposed with an EQ, like five bands EQ, you can sit down and tweak it for hours, days, weeks, you know, check out all the sound possibilities. Here, you just have one knob. You turn it, you don't like it, you remove it, you like it, you keep it, and you move on. The decision-making is really fast, which is very important, I think, to the creative part of music. After we did a lot of modeling uh, 
plugins where we've modeled vintage uh, devices, uh, equalizers, compressors, and uh, channels. It seemed like we've done everything, but um, there came up an idea from uh, one of our product managers. We had to come up with an equalizer that gives the user a choice per band of EQ which kind of uh, uh, vintage modeling that they would use. And this brought up a new challenge, which we had no idea how to do, which was to unify uh, the cutoffs, gains, and cues of all the, all the old models. So if, for example, in the past, we were modeling an SSL uh, equalizer, and that SSL had certain cutoffs and certain gains it was able to do, um, and certain uh, shapes of the filters it was able to do. Here we were trying to do something that could switch uh, continuously between different types of devices and preserving continuity. So we had to actually reinvent SSL. We actually had to, to imagine what all the devices would sound like if it was positioned on a cutoff which was never available on the original device. And for this, we came up with a totally new technology. We had to analyze the original circuits in a mathematical manner so that we could extrapolate their behavior between the, the parameters. And in addition, we came up with a new idea. Why not be able to position these cutoffs on musical notes? So if you're tuned to 440 hertz, for example, in your scale, you would probably want the major or minor notes for that, that scale and to, to be able to position your cutoffs there. Because that gives you a, an ability to enhance correctly the notes of a piano or of a keyboard or of a guitar. And that uh, gives another challenge. How do you put all these modeling plugins with exactly the correct shape where their, their shape matches some, some uh, predefined cutoff. And so we were matching them, uh, the original curves, and eventually we came up with something that is really smooth. It allows you switching all these analog models and also some of our vintage digital models that we did in old plugins and waves. And you can have all of them in one band of the equalizer, and then another band of the same equalizer can have another model. So you can do your low passes one way, high passes another way, you can, you can build different uh, frequency ranges in, in different manners. And there came the, the most flexible plugin ever. Another one which I'm really proud of is the Q clone, which enables you to model EQs in real time by creating a real time convolution filter. I mean, it sounds complicated, but it's really simple. You know, the way it works is that it sends a test signal to any hardware EQ every 400 milliseconds, and then it generates a, a filter based on that frequency response. In my studio, I have it on my, on my Neve desk. I have it here on channel 24. So I have it right here and I, I tweak the knobs of the actual Neve desk and it creates a filter for me uh, wow. on the screen in real time, which can obviously be saved with the session. And when I done that, let's say I'm on a kick drum, I just tweak it, I hear it and I see it. I mean, I, mean, I don't even have to look at the screen because it's like, physically there. And when I'm happy with it, I just press hold. And then I can open a new instance, flatten my EQ and start again using the same EQ. So I don't even have to, you know, uh, do all that. And it's all stored with the session. So that's something I'm really proud of. I met uh, Digico for the first time when we were in search of a partner to do the SoundGrid product for live. And uh, I met uh, Digico's uh, managing director, James Gordon, and uh, we kind of uh, developed a relationship where we trust each other, we work well together, and uh, at the end of the day, it's all about relationships. So um, several years after we launched the first SoundGrid product with Digico. We were at the NAM uh, exhibition. Uh, I think it was 
2011. Um, and we walked outside for a coffee and started thinking about uh, all the technology we and Digico, Waves and Digico have together and how we can benefit the recording market with this technology. And uh, this is how we came up with uh, several products that really have uh, a determining factor to them. One is they provide an enhancement to you, the recording engineer in the studio, no matter what product you own at this stage, but it does provide you with an advantage. The second is that it's groundbreaking. No one else in the industry can provide what we're providing in within these boxes, no, no matter which one. And we've uh, kind of marked it out into three segments. Um, let's call the first segment Maddy to Soundgrid. And uh, Digigrid, which is the brand name uh, Waves and Digico have created to provide these boxes to the industry, created a box called an MGB and an MGO. They're Maddy to BNC and Maddy to Optical. These boxes basically take uh, up to 128 channels of MADI and convert them into SoundGrid, which provides you with real-time processing, uh, less than one millisecond, uh, networking, and uh, full redundancy uh, if you're processing on the servers, and the ability to record while processing. Um, compared to other systems where the recording is separate, from the processing, uh, and when you do processing, it's native, and there's no real-time processing, and you can't use uh, uh, high-end plugins to do non-real-time processing because the latency is just crazy. Uh, this box does it all in one simple unit, uh, obviously plus the networking as well. When you bring that to uh, a live sound engineer, he goes, whoa, pretty amazing. Uh, or a monitor engineer. But these boxes are now being sold for broadcast as well. Um, take, for example, one of the mobiles who, who was involved in the uh, uh, Grammys, uh, who actually was using an Avid uh, HDX system through a MADI router and uh, directly into an MGB, or, or maybe it was an MGO box, and uh, processing waves with, on the, with the HDX on a dedicated real-time processing uh, computer with a server running multi-rack sound grid. So these boxes, which we launched late 2013, uh, are now uh, in many of the higher-end broadcast, live sound, and monitoring trucks and, and front-of-house gigs. The second segment we were looking at to create was something to talk to uh, Pro Tools users. Uh, and there's so many of them, and there's so many different Pro Tools users. There's TDM, there's HDX, there's HD native, and there's native. The big game changer over here is that we're providing real-time processing and monitoring for native users, Pro Tools native users and HD native users. DLS and DLI both have DigiLink connectors at the back. These boxes will provide any Pro Tools user with connectivity through any I.O. legacy on you and real-time processing if you're using the DLS. The third product we were thinking about during that meeting at NAM was the DigiGrid iOS. The iOS is really your best friend if you're a native user, no matter what DAW you're using suddenly what you have is real-time processing on a native DAW. Real-time processing not only with Waves plugins, but with third-party plugins as well. Networking with an iOS, you can now network your home recording studio or your full blast studio. You can use more than one DAW to hook up, and it's all CAT 5E or CAT 6 compatible. It's funny because in my webinars, I don't feel like I'm doing anything unique or special. I just describe what I do. 
And since I'm very technical, I can kind of explain that in real time and I can give reasons to why I do that and not just uh, saying, yeah, this sounds great and all that. I just, I, I explain why I turn that knob and why I do that and why and how it affects the other, I don't know, channels in the, in the mix and all that. And I think that that's why people, that's why people like it because it's, it's not glorified or anything. And, and in, my, in my books, that was my approach to kind of demystify the process. I write a lot about the differences and the similarities between analog mixing or recording and uh, working in the g- digital domain. And I think that a lot of people that grow up today, they don't have access to old school studios and, you know, old school kind of way of working and all that. And, uh, and that gives them a glimpse into that world um, by very simple and, I don't know, down to earth sort of um, view on what's going on. So it's not like Fairchild, wow, that's a legendary and glorious. It's a compressor, it's nice. And this is what it does. And this is what the digital equivalent does and what you do with that. And because for me, it's mainly what you do with that. It's not what it is. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's what you do with it. And I think that, that people kind of, kind of get that. I wish when I started, I, I would have uh, so many channels of information uh, available to me because uh, I actually remember very early on I was assisting a very big engineer and and he actually didn't want me to see the settings on his Lexicon 224. It was his secret. And so people didn't really share information and, share, and didn't share knowledge. And I think that uh, these days, obviously, uh, it's all changed. But um, still people relay to something that is down to earth. Um, people, a lot of people are, you know, confused, scared of the, the gear and the, the, the kind of endless possibilities. And when you, when you see something that is explained to you or, or demonstrated to you in a very simple and unassuming way, I think it, it kind of there's something reassuring about that.